Good morning and good morning. My name is Dr. Jill Einstein and I'm the Director of Physician Engagement for the MAVEN Project. And thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to MAVEN Project's educational session on medical Spanish crash course, learn to communicate with your Spanish speaking patients in a correct and efficient manner with Dr. Tamara Rios. Dr. Rios is CEO of Rios Associates. She was raised in both Acapulco, Guerrero, Mexico and Tucson, Arizona, is bilingual and bicultural and holds a BA and an MS in psychology with a minor in Spanish, as well as a PhD in psychology and education. She's been teaching and coordinating programs with Rios Associates since 2000. Dr. Rios has served as a consultant to various hospitals and medical groups for over 15 years. In addition, she has collaborated with and served as a consultant to a number of international hospitals and medical groups in Mexico, Spain, and Peru. I know that we only have a short time today um, for this crash course in medical Spanish, but if any of the clinics are interested in having more in-depth um, um, opportunities and courses with Dr. Rios and Rios Associates, um, I'll be giving sending out information to you about how to get connected with Dr. Rios. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Einstein. And I'd like to thank everyone else for joining in. I am going to share my screen so we can get started with the slideshow. Before we actually get started, I just wanted to thank everyone for all that you're doing for your patients, your community, and especially the Latino patient population. So welcome, bienvenidos. We're going to get started. I'd like to disclose that I do not have any conflict of interest uh, in anything concerning the CME activity. Now, I want to point out, we particularly gear our courses to those Latino patients that you are working with that are born and raised in Latin America and who have come here later in life. So that said, we're trying to bridge that language and cultural gap. I just wanted to share briefly, there are 20 Spanish speaking countries and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. So that in mind, we want to be mindful that there are regional differences, not just with the language, but also with the culture. So I do want to point out, you will notice with your Latino patients, some different terms that we might be using along the way. And I'll share some of those later. But I do also want to point out that because there are 20 Spanish speaking countries, you are going to notice some different terms, aside from the fact of Spanglish that comes up with the nice mix of English and Spanish, you will notice some other terms that you might recognize and think, wait a minute, is that correct? Or is it not correct? So I just want to share a few of those. You might have heard for baby bottle, mamila, biberon, pacha. You might have even heard just the general term of botella. Uh, a couple of other ones just to share with you. You might have also noticed the word for stool, excremento, materia fecal, eses, and again, more for the kids or depending on education level, we might even use popo uh, and caca. So you definitely want to start with the correct term, work your way down. Outside of the medical setting, a common term to speak, to communicate, to converse, to chat, hablar, conversar, charlar, discutir. So these are just some examples of how there's not just one way of communicating in Spanish, but we will try to focus on a universal Spanish, the more proper, correct Spanish, because there is that expectation stepping into the medical setting that we will have that more formal uh, speech, even if we don't express ourselves that way. So I'm going to continue along here. One more point before we actually dive into medical Spanish. Many of you might wonder, what is the difference between Latinx, Latino, Hispanic? What's the correct term? What should I use? And I'd like to just briefly touch on each one. I know Latinx has been a term that you've probably heard more and more lately. And it is a wonderful term because it's a gender neutral term for people of Latin American descent. So it really is a very inclusive term for everyone. I do also want to point out it is a term that was developed 
developed here in the US. So that said, if we're currently living in Latin America or just recently arriving here, we might not be familiar with it just because it is not a recognized term yet in Latin America or with your Spanish speaking only uh, patient population. So hopefully we'll catch up and, and get there, but don't be surprised if we look at you a blank stare, perplexed, or actually say, oh no, that's not spelled correctly. It's with an O or an A. It's just that we have not yet been exposed or familiar with that term. Now, I do want to point out also Hispanic versus Latino. Now, Latino. Latino is someone who is from Latin America. So what does that mean? That would, ex that would actually exclude someone from Spain in Europe and also from French Guiana in Africa, which a lot of people are curious, wait a minute, there's a Spanish speaking country in Africa? Yes, there is. Now, anyone else? Anyone else would be again in Latin America. Now, Hispanic. Hispanic is someone that is from a Spanish speaking country. So many of you might recognize, ah, that doesn't include Brazil. And you're absolutely right. So Brazil, and there's actually a few other countries and territories in Latin America that are not included in that. So Guyana is one, Suriname, and then also um, French Guiana. So that's just a little bit of background. My suggestion and just what we've noticed throughout working with the community of Spanish speakers is go with what your Latino or your Hispanic or your Latinx patient prefers, follow their lead. Many of us oftentimes do like to just say, the country we're from. So for example, soy mexicano, soy mexicana, soy colombiano, colombiana, cubano, cubana, etc. So just follow your patient's lead on that. Okay, we're officially going to get started. So I'd like to just start off with the introductions and greetings because this is our opportunity to really invest in the beginning to try to establish that confianza. Confianza means trust and that is extremely important in the Latino community. So there's some great ways of doing that. It doesn't require a lot of Spanish. In fact, even a little bit will go a long way. So if you can get some courtesy phrases in there, that would be fantastic, which I will get to in the next slide. I do want to preface, however, I know we probably have a mixture of proficiency levels. So bear with me for an hour to get to everyone's proficiency level. I will do my best. I'll, I'll start off with the more basic terms, which are still correct. And I might chime in in Spanish for those of you that are more advanced to share some other alternatives. So for those of you that are just beginning and you hear me maybe go off into Spanish a little bit, don't worry, don't stress out. Uh, it's just an alternative for those that are at a more advanced level. So again, if you can attempt to see, speak some courtesy phrases, and again, starting off with that more formal uh, interaction. So for example, rather than hola, que tal, which is perfectly fine, it's hello, how's it going? But it's a more casual, and you're in a medical setting, so you want to present it in a more professional manner. So buenos dias, good morning, and even though I can't hear you, you are on mute, still repeat after me, buenos dias, and that's your good morning. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, and for anyone working the night or the evening shift, buenas noches, good evening. Now, you might have recalled from your studies in Spanish or just communicating out and about in town and in your travels that there are different ways of communicating. My name is, I call myself. So I'm sure many of you heard of me llamo, por ejemplo, me llamo Tamara. It literally is, I call myself Tamara. Mi nombre es, my name is. Tamara. And in the medical setting or a more professional setting such as yours, soy is considered the, the preferred way. So soy, I am, and it allows you to add your title. So for example, soy el, el doctor Jones for a male doctor or physician. Soy la doctora, with the A at the end, Jones for a female doctor or physician. Now, I know many of you might say, okay, well, how do we say physician assistant, nurse practitioner? So I want to just point out, as of yet, currently, we do not have that profession in Latin America. Hopefully, we will catch up. But that is why we struggle a little bit trying to find the equivalent in Spanish. 
Now, nurse practitioners, if I have any in the group, you could, I think the best option would be to say enfermero or enfermera, which is a male nurse or female nurse, and then adding on especialista, which sounds like specialist. So it implies and insinuates there's more formal schooling, more uh, studies, more just expertise in that area. Now, you might have heard, for those of you that are nurse practitioners or who already speak Spanish, you might have heard enfermero, enfermera practicante, which is taken from English. However, I pause and I, I cringe because if we do not speak any English, we just hear practicante, which sounds like practicing, which is a bit unsettling if we're going in to receive care. So, there's also the enfermero, enfermera ambasa, avanzada. These are all terms, once again, that are developed in the US. So I wanna encourage enfermero or enfermera especialista because that resonates, it makes sense. For the physician assistants, unfortunately, we don't have a term yet in Spanish either because the profession doesn't exist. Many of you might've heard the term asociado al médico or socio al médico, which in Spanish for native speakers, and if we don't speak English, that implies a business partner, usually the one investing money. So that throws us off. It is confusing. Now, you might have also heard asistente al médico, which actually means medical assistant. So it is different what we're trying to convey. Our suggestion here at Rios Associates is just say it in English, but with a Spanish accent, physician assistant. And if you know a little bit more Spanish, you can get into a little bit more uh, about your role. But it's better to use the English with the Spanish accent than a false Spanish translation that's just going to cause confusion. Now, for those of you that are nurses, enfermero, enfermera, if we just want a general term, just like we use in English, provider, proveedor is becoming more and more commonly used and acceptable. So feel free. Now, moving along, I know many of you already know the mucho gusto. Nice to meet you. If your patient beat you to it, you can just respond with igualmente, which is likewise. Think of equal. Other terms you can say, es un placer, it's a pleasure. El gusto es mío, the pleasure is mine, and so forth. Now, getting into just some other common courtesies and pleasantries, como esta, how are you? And we'll get into a little bit more of the Spanish in the next slide, but I wanna just share a few cultural tips that I think will help in building that trust, confianza with your Latino patients. So because we are in a medical setting, using the formal address is encouraged. So for example, señor, mister, señora, missus, many of you probably heard señorita uh, as well for miss. Now, trying to pronounce your patient's name and surnames correctly is important. I know many of you might sometimes wonder, gosh, my patient has so many names. There's like two or three first names and then two or three last names or surnames. Don't feel bad about not following up on that and not really understanding it. In fact, we have an entire lesson in our textbook about the naming conventions. And I actually am uh, happy to send a slide over if those of you are interested later, I, I'm happy to provide you with that which we'll have our, our contact information later if you'd like that slide. Uh, but in the meantime, once you've established your patient's name, use it often because by doing that, it signals that you're, you care and you're offering what in Spanish we call personalismo, lo que se llama en español personalismo. So that is giving that personal touch where we feel like you actually truly care. So in Spanish, in Latin America, we tend to value much more a personal relationship and dialogue an interaction over a business one. So if we feel that you're getting straight down to business immediately, it can be off-putting for many Latinos, which in turn will not help in building that trust. So a great way to really get across that personalismo is with the smile and the body language, the warm tone of voice, kind of going up in tone and showing a little bit of uh, just animation, again, in your comfort zone. Now, if you're uncertain of how to pronounce our name, don't be shy to ask because it shows that you care. So again, names matter, tone of voice matters, the body language. I know right now during COVID times, we might not be shaking hands, something that we do quite often in Latin America. There's a lot of personal touch involved in interactions. 
But a nice way to replace that again is smile, warm tone of voice, and waving. Always ask about family members because that signals that you truly understand that cultural nuance that with the Latinos, family is number one. So anytime you want to get some education and enhance that, always insert family. For example, eating healthier, exercising, always include doing that with family and you'll get a better result. Bueno, vamos a continuar. We're going to continue now with the saludos. Now, first of all, you I'm sure will recall from our last slide, the buenos dias, buenas tardes y buenas noches. Remember we did the soy el doctor Fernandez for a male doctor, soy la doctora Fernandez, soy su enfermero or enfermera Jose. If you'd like to add on the question of, oh, and you are, y ustedes? If you have a patient with their family member that's joined on the visit, you can ask, y ustedes, and you are, if it's plural, if there's a whole family there, which oftentimes happens. I know now during COVID times, we're trying to limit that. But if you want to make it plural, y ustedes son. So many of you might re uh, recall that usted is the formal you. Now, let's move along. Como se llama? What is your name? Obviously, you know your patient's name because it's in the chart. But if you have that family member or family members there, it's, it is considered quite polite to ask and inquire about the whole family. I know many of you might think, oh, I only have 15 minutes, but that one extra minute will really be well worth it. Now, going back to the names, remember we talked about that in the last slide. It's perfectly fine to ask Prefiere, prefiere Juan o Señor López. And that way you can ask, do you prefer Juan o Señor López? Prefiere María o Señora Gómez, see? ¿Sí? So we'll come back to that word prefiere in a moment, to prefer. Mucho gusto, you'll recall from the last slide. Here's a good one. Pásele, come on in, siéntese, sit down. These are all the command forms. Now, in Spanish, we tend to ask in a slightly different matter what seems to be bothering you with que molestias tiene. And you'll see here I have in parentheses, oi, it can't hurt to help guide us because you don't want to know quite yet about what symptoms or concerns that we've had from five years ago. You will eventually get to that, but help guide us during that visit. So que molestias, what seems to be bothering you? The molestias means bothers. And the nice thing with this question question is that you're asking about anything and everything. It's not limited to just physical pain. It can be insomnia. It can be anxiety. It can be any of that. So this is a great question to ask. I have some couple, uh, I have a couple of other options if you prefer. ¿Qué problema médico tiene? I do want to encourage for those of you that do choose the ¿Qué problema médico tiene? to really attempt to use the medico in there. Because I notice sometimes we might forget the medico and just ask, ¿qué problema tiene? Which is still grammatically correct. However, culturally it can come across as, oh, well, what's your problem? Not the most welcoming. The other concern with just asking, ¿qué problema tiene? Is Spanish is very literal. So I might feel compelled to share all of my problems with you that are not medically related. So again, because you have limited amount of time, really try to guide us with specific questions such as that. ¿Qué problema médica tiene? Now we're going to move along to a really common way to ask it in a lot of the larger cities in Latin America. ¿Cuál es el motivo de su visita hoy? What is the motive? Think of that word motive in English. What is the motive? What is the reason of your visit today? You can always switch out motivo with razón. So that would sound like, ¿Cuál es la razón de su visita hoy? Now, if we can try to stay away from the literal uh, translations or interpretations of, well, what brings you in today? ¿Qué le trajo hoy? It, it just does not make a lot of sense for those of us that don't speak English. It's not a common way to get that across for your native Spanish speakers. Another one that I just want to share with you to be aware of, I know oftentimes uh, that we'll ask in English, how can I help you? Which in Spanish would then uh, turn into, ¿En qué le puedo ayudar? ¿Cómo le puedo servir? Which is absolutely fine grammatically, but it's a bit more common when you are selling uh, an item. So more in a sales setting. So we want to feel like we're in a warm, welcoming environment that is in that medical setting. So these are some great questions to preface with your visit. Now, I'd like to add on some other ones that you probably have already heard along the way. ¿Cómo se siente? How do you feel? ¿Tiene dolor? Do you have pain? Some of you might have even heard, le duele, which means 
Well, does it hurt you? Literally, is it hurtful to you? And then finally, a really good question. I really want to encourage everyone to memorize. ¿Cómo sigue? How are you coming along? And this is a great follow-up visit. So anytime after that first visit, you can then begin your visit with ¿Cómo sigue? If you'd like to be more specific and make sure that we stay on track with your more colorful, expressive, animated Latino patient. You might think, oh no, I know she, she has a tendency to talk about a lot of different medical problems and I'm only seeing her for diabetes today. Then you might want to make it more specific and ask, ¿Cómo sigue su diabetes? ¿Cómo sigue su dolor, your pain? ¿Cómo sigue su, your, and then add on what? the symptom might be. So I am going to move us along and feel free to uh, add on any questions you might have in the chat box and I'll be happy to answer those afterwards. So I wanted to share just a few more easy terms that you can pick up with ease here because they're similar to English and they are considered correct and formal. So we've already seen a good portion of these. The buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches. We already know the soy, I am, the mucho gusto. If you can add on a few more pleasantries in Spanish than we would in English, I think it really will help put your Latino patient at ease. Some of those will be por favor, please, gracias, thank you. And for those of you that speak more Spanish or are native Spanish speakers, you know that we do tend to add on a little bit more than just gracias. So a muchas gracias is a thank you very much. Mil gracias, a thousand thanks. Muchísimas gracias. So within your comfort zone, if you can add on a little bit more to that, it just really makes us feel good and a little bit more comfortable. It's just what we're more accustomed to. The reason why we tend to add on more pleasantries is because the Spanish language is actually built on commands. Unlike the English language where we tend to ask more questions to demonstrate wanting to be more polite and more courteous versus in Spanish, we tend to give more commands, but we balance them out with pleasantries. A perfect example of that would be siéntese por favor. It is the command form to sit down, which in English can sound a bit more like a mandate. Oh my goodness. But in Spanish, it no longer sounds like that because we add on the pleasantry of por favor. So again, the reason why we do that is to soften up those commands. Vamos a continuar. Let's continue along. Necesita, speaking of commands. Necesita, you need to. Or it can also be the question form of, do you need? For example, que necesita? What do you need? Necesita is an, a great, great key power verb, which we're going to get to shortly. But with this, you can just add on the infinitive, which many of you might wonder, what is an infinitive? So an infinitive verb is a verb prior to conjugating, which you might recognize as an AR ending verb, such as tomar, to drink or to take, an ER ending verb, such as comer, to eat, and an IR ending verb, such as vivir, to live. So it's the verb prior to conjugating. So all you have to do is just add that on to necesita, and you have your perfect sentence structure. What that would look like would be, necesita tomar la medicina. You need to take the medicine. Necesita comer más frutas y vegetales. You need to eat more fruits and vegetables. So what we can do is bypass the command form. So for those of you that are used to conjugating, you might know that we have many tenses in Spanish. We conjugate in a number of them. And you might be really excited to know that, oh my gosh, I don't have to worry about one of those tenses. So a nice way to bypass that command form and not have to worry about changing the endings is just use necesita and the infinitive. Another good time to use necesita is where you want to be firm with your patients. You wanna make sure that we actually follow through with your instructions, whether those be the prescription and follow-up instructions or just good recommendations that you would like to give to us. Quickly, I want to point out, I know in English, oftentimes we will say it's necessary, which you can translate into Spanish as es necesario. We do not use that that much in the medical setting because it's interpreted as, well, it's necessary in general, but no one said I needed to do it versus necesita 
is very specific. You need to do this. You are placing the responsibility on your patient, meaning we will actually follow through with that versus the es necesario. It's just kind of perceived as a uh, suggestion. So anytime you do want to be firm with us, use necesita, especially with those prescription and follow-up instructions. Now you can always emphasize with the following es muy importante. And this is another wonderful way to add on the infinitive. You no longer need to conjugate. So an example is muy importante. Importante tomar más agua. It's important to drink more water. And we'll get into some further uh, examples of that in a moment. Remember we talked about prefiere, for example, prefiere María o señora Gómez. Do you prefer María o señora Gómez? If you just want to ask, ¿qué prefiere? Well, what do you prefer? Now, this is great for some other questions that are fairly easy. Prefiere inglés o español? Do you prefer English or Spanish? Because you might have bilingual uh, patients and you don't want to just assume that everyone only speaks Spanish. Another example, prefiere un intérprete. Do you prefer an interpreter or no or not? So those are some good options there. Eh, for those of you that speak more Spanish, para ustedes que ya hablan más español o que son totalmente bilingües, también pueden hacer la pregunta. ¿Prefieren jarabe o pastillas para su forma de medicina? So do you prefer, jarabe is liquid medicine, ¿sí? syrup, for example, or pastillas, pills. Bien, vamos a continuar. A couple of other easy terms that look like English. Controlado. So está controlado. It is controlled or question, is it controlled? Versus no está controlado, it is not controlled. So these are conversations that come up quite often. So a nice thing to say to your patients that are actually controlando la diabetes, por ejemplo, ¿sí? is to just congratulate us. Felicidades, señora Gómez, está controlado su diabetes which is again, the congratulations in Spanish and Latin America, we are oftentimes cheering and applauding for even the smallest steps. So feel free to do that. And you really will notice a much better reaction from your Latino patients. It's gonna encourage us to continue doing better uh, in terms of controlling and also preventative care and other things in regards to our health. Now, if we do need to get across and convey, oh, lo siento, señor Gomez, I'm sorry, señor Gomez, su diabetes no está controlado. Your diabetes is not controlled. And then you can lead us into your educational spiel and some recommendations, which again, then would lead us into necesita, right? Necesita. And we can get into some of those in a moment of what we can encourage. Bien. We are going to continue along with me explico, which is a wonderful way to ask if your patient understands what you just communicated. So I know we have that teach back method. Unfortunately, in the Latino culture, it just does not come across the same way and it does not resonate. So it almost is a very stress inducing question. <sighs> oh no, the doctor's quizzing me and we're just going to feel so embarrassed that we can't respond. Obviously, that's the goal. You want to make sure we understand but there's a different way you can ask that. Many of you might recognize, comprende, entiende, do you understand, which is grammatically correct. However, culturally, it can come off a little bit condescending. Well, did you understand, comprende? Which of course will feel compelled. So, oh, sí, doctora. So a nice way around that is asking, me explico, which means, was I able to explain myself? Para ustedes que ya hablan bien el español, también pueden agregar lo siguiente. Tiene sentido. Does that make sense? If you'd like to add that one on. Another great way to elicit your patient's perspective. ¿Qué opina? And don't forget to use our names. ¿Qué opina, señora Gómez? Well, what are your thoughts? What's your opinion on what I just shared? So it's just another way, a more common way culturally in Latin America that we try to gather what our patients understood or, or didn't understand. Bueno, vamos a continuar. Some nice reassuring terms. No se preocupe. Think of to preoccupy. Don't worry. Don't preoccupy yourself. It's a nice, soothing, reassuring, comforting term that you can give if you see that your patient is visibly upset. Along with tranquilo or tranquila for a female patient. Now, not to be confused with calmese or calmate in the two form. That is much different. That's really more taking a stern tone of settle down. Usually we use that with our children uh, or anyone that's uh, a little bit more agitado, see? But this is on the contrary. This is really comforting. It's okay. Don't worry, Señora Gomez. No se preocupe. Tranquila. So again, these are some great terms to use if you notice that your patient uh, is upset, nervous, stressed, anxious, etc. Bueno, vamos a continuar. Permítame. 
This is a really easy one. It sounds like permit me to, or will you permit me? Permítame. This is another great one where you can add on the infinitive, which we're going to see shortly. An example of that would be permítame examinarle. And that's a great way to begin your exam, especially those more sensitive exams, such as the pap smear and the pelvic exam. We'll get back to permítame in a moment in the next couple slides. I want to go on to a couple of the other ones. Un momento, if you need to step out for a moment, if you need to check something, un momento. Lo siento, anytime you need to convey I'm sorry for whatever it might be, this is a great one. I know many of you have probably heard disculpe, perdone, and those are great, but just to, just to distinguish, those those are actually ways of saying, forgive me. And really, in the medical setting, the lo siento is just more commonly used in Latin America. Because again, by using the perdóneme or the discúlpeme, it's suggesting, you know, gosh, I've done something wrong. Please forgive me. Uh, lo siento is just more of a, I'm sorry to hear that. I feel for you. I am sorry. Lo siento por la tardanza. Tardanza, think of tardiness for being late. Lo siento por la demora, think of delay. Or you can totally rearrange that to just gracias por su, co su confianza, gracias por su paciencia, thank you for your trust, thank you for your patience. Bien. A couple more for the goodbyes. The cuídese is a very nice way to say take care. May it go well for you. Goodbye as you're saying goodbye to your patients. Another one I want to squeeze in there really quick. Saludos a la familia. So I briefly mentioned the importance of family. Family is vital. It's the most important aspect of a Latino's life, really. So being that you include that in your goodbye, it signals to us, oh my gosh, he or she, they really understand. They totally get the culture. So it's always nice to go back home and let the family know, oh, my physician or whoever it might be that was there sends their greetings. So that said, I want to point out that we're going to just get into some cognates here that I think will be really helpful. Let's take a look. If anyone is confused with what is a cognate or que significa un cognado, a cognate, and not just limited to English and Spanish, a cognate is a word that has a similarity in the root in two languages, in this case, English and Spanish, although it could be other languages as well. So a common example, words that end in cian in English will end in cion in Spanish. Por ejemplo, recuperation, la recuperación. By the way, if a word ends in sion in español, it's feminine. So what does that mean? We're going to use the article la, which is the in English. Un ejemplo, an example, la irritación. A couple of other ones, la laceración, la complicación. There's a number of other ones that you can use. La inflamación, inflammation, la información, information. So it's a nice one to have handy there. Let's move along to some other ones. Your ITY endings in English will have edad endings in Espanol and occasionally edad. So that said, all you have to do is switch those endings. Rather than maternity, it will be la maternidad. And you will notice that we're also using the feminine article la. And that is a rule. If it ends in edad or edad, it will be feminine. So a couple of other ones, la ansiedad. I don't have, I don't believe I have other ones here, but la sexualidad, la mortalidad, la universidad, la posibilidad, etc. Vamos a continuar. The easiest of all of them are going to be the itis endings in English, which in Spanish will be itis. Y también son femeninas, and they're also feminine. So let's take a look. La bursitis. La hepatitis, la artritis, a couple of other ones, la conjuntivitis, la diverticulitis, la gastritis, etc., etc. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how the cognates work. Now I want to share one more with you, the ologist endings, because we need to be able to share with our Latino patients a little bit about some of the specialists they might be seeing, or you might be referring them to the specialist. So that said, ologist endings will be ologo endings in Espanol for male uh, providers and ologa for female. So for example, gone, uh, gynecologist, excuse me, ginecologo, or for female, ginecologa. See, dermatologist, dermatologo, dermatologa, cardiologist, cardiologo, cardiologa, nephrologo, urologo, and we can go on and on with that. There's one more that I don't have on the list that I just want to insert here. Your LLY endings in English 
In other words, typically, usually, generally, we'll have mente endings in Spanish. Típicamente, generalmente, usualmente, normalmente, etc. Bien, vamos a continuar. We're going to continue on with this wonderful concept called key power verbs. So remember we talked about necesita in the first couple slides, you need to. And I'd mentioned you can just add on the infinitive. So that said, let's take a look. Necesita inyectarse la insulina. You need to inject the insulin. And we can add on a little bit more. Cada día every day or each day. So as you can see, we're using this as a prescription and follow-up instruction. Necesita tomar la medicina cada día. You need to take the medicine every day. And if you want to add on a la misma hora, at the same time or al mismo tiempo, they're both correct. You can also add on con comida, with food. As examples, bueno, vamos a continuar. Now you can also add on a couple of other ones. For example, and I'm gonna add on all my key power verbs here so we can visualize them with more ease. Debe, debe has a few meanings. It comes from the infinitive deber. Deber means you ought to, you should. It also means to owe money, but we're gonna keep that outside of this particular lesson because that's not applicable. So right here, we wanna encourage our patients you should do this. So it's a great alternative to necesita. You're also replacing the command form as you're doing with necesita and adding on the infinitive. So for example, debe consultar con el especialista. You should or ought to consult, which is also in English, to see the specialist. Now, the nice thing with debe is you can turn this into a negative command. In other words, no debe tomar alcohol con esta medicina. You should not take alcohol with this medicine, or it's the equivalent of don't take alcohol with the medicine. So again, the debe allows you to use it in the command and also in the negative command, something that we cannot do with necesita, because if we use no, the negative with necesita, it would come off as, well, no necesita tomar la medicina, you don't need to take the medicine. So again, it's a little bit different use. Now, let's take a look at a couple of other key power verbs. Puede, many of you guys will recognize that, is to be able to. So again, these are all the usted form, the formal form of you, which is what we're really trying to aim for in those visits with our patients, rather than the tu form. I know many of us get comfortable with that. The tu is the familiar form. But in a medical setting, you really do want to try to convey that more professional, formal Spanish. So hence, we're using all of the usted forms here. So puede, can you, or are you able to? So this is a great way to determine if your patient is actually capable of doing something. For example, puede caminar sin ayuda. Can you or are you able to walk without help? Puede respirar sin dificultad? Are you able to breathe without difficulty? So any of these will be a great way to really convey, are you able to do this? Can you do this? It's also a great way for those of you that are pediatricians to ask about developmental questions, right? This is a great way. Puede, go down your list of infinitives. Now let's continue on. Favor de. Favor de is an excellent, it's not really a verb, but it's an excellent phrase here. And it's not please. Many people assume it's please, but it's do me the favor of. And this is another great way to replace the command form. It's a little bit different, however, than necesita and debe. Favor de, do me the favor of, is a much more polite way to command your Latino patient. So what does that mean is to give us that command or that mandate in, say, your... Uh, exam room setting, whether that be during the physical exam, the neuro exam, the pap smear exam, you want to politely ask us to do something. For example, favor de respirar profundo. Do me the favor of taking a deep breath. Favor de abrir la boca. Do me the favor of opening your mouth. Favor de extender el brazo. To extend your arm. It's not there, but we can add that one on. Now, this I am going to share with, with my uh, more advanced speakers. Para ustedes que ya hablan bien el español, con toda la confianza del mundo, pueden simplemente utilizar la forma del mandato. O sea, sería respire profundo, abra la boca, etc. Pero se pueden intercambiar, y eso es lo bello del español, es de que no solo existe una manera de expresarnos. ¿sí? So for those of you that are getting started, don't worry at all. I just wanted to add on a couple of other alternative options for uh, the more advanced speakers. 
Bueno, finalmente, finally, I want to share that voy a, va a, which many of you might recognize as that future tense. So the future tense, and by the way, there are two future tense forms in the Spanish language. Right now, we're just going to look at that voy a, I am going to, and va a, you are going to, or a third person, meaning he or she, el o ella. So this is a great way to inform your patient what will be taking place during that visit. What are you going to do to your patient and what is a third person in your setting going to do to the patient? For example, yo, right? The yo, the I form. Voy a hacerle un examen físico. Voy a examinarle. So the first one, voy a hacerle un examen físico, I'm going to do a physical exam. Para ustedes que ya hablan bien el español, también pueden agregar el verbo realizar, que es un poquito más profesional, más correcto. Voy a realizarle un examen físico. También se puede utilizar con pruebas, con exámenes, con análisis de sangre, eh, igual con procedimientos y también con cirugías, para que tomen eso eh, en cuenta. Ok, back to the, the basic here of the boy app. Now you can add on anything here. Voy a inyectarle, to inject, right? I'm going to give you an injection. Literally in Spanish, we go straight to the verb. So we bypass that give and go straight to, I am going to inject you, which we don't ordinarily structure that way in English, but you get the gist of it. Now, if you want to tell your patient the usted form, what they might uh, notice, feel, encounter during that visit, you could say, Señora Gómez va a sentir un poco de dolor. You're going to feel a little bit of pain. And here you can add on anything. Va a sentir un poco de presión. Presión is pressure. Durante el examen de Papa Nicolau, during the pap smear exam. ¿sí? Va a sentir un poquito, un poco, a little bit de ardor, burning. You can just fill in the blank there. Now, the benefit of using the usted form, that you formal, is that you can also include that third person, el o ella, he or she. So what does that mean? With va'a, all you have to do is preface it with who in your setting will be doing something to your patient. So what that would look like would be la enfermera, the nurse, va a vacunarle. It's going to give you a vaccine or literally vaccinate you. ¿sí? La recepcionista, the receptionist, va a programar su próxima cita. Is going to schedule your next appointment. And you might notice you can interchange programar with hacer, to make or to do, hacer su próxima cita, or agendar, which is another way to say to schedule, agendar su próxima cita. One last example, el técnico, Sounds like technician, right? El técnico va a sacar radiografías, x-rays, which incidentally, there's other ways of referring to radiografías. You might hear rayos X, you might hear placas, which is a little bit more of a slang term, but you will hear it at some point. So that's the way the future tense works. Now, I want to add on one more, le recomiendo, which comes from the verb, the infinitive, recomendar. So this is where we're going to say, I recommend to you, comer más frutas y vegetales, le recomiendo caminar cada día por 30 minutos, to walk every day for 30 minutes, le recomiendo meditar, to meditate. Any recommendations, suggestions that you are going to give, be sure to add on con su familia, with your family, because it'll encourage us to do that more. We're more inclined to follow through with things if we see how it will affect all of our family. We tend to be more of a self-sacrificing self and do more what we feel would be the best interest for our family than for ourselves. So a nice cultural touch here, if you really want us to encourage, say, lifestyle changes, really add on family with that. And, and you'll see, uh, I think, a better difference with that. Bien. The permítame. This one is a really good one because, as we saw in that previous slide, you can just add on the infinitive in a very nice way. So what that looks like is permítame examinarle, especially for those sensitive exams. Permítame examinarle, permítame hacerle un examen de Papa Nicolau. Permítame inyectarle, right? As about you're about to inject them, you can say that. Permítame ayudarle to help you. So if you want to help your patient sit up, stand up, lie down, turn around, that's a great one 
to add on. Uh, another one, if you need to leave the, the room for a moment, permítame. If you need to politely interrupt a conversation where all the family members feel compelled to chime in and share their side of the story, you can also, in a very polite way, say, oh, permítame, and get us back on track. Okay, bien. Now, I want to take us to just a list of some AR verbs here. Again, you can take any of these AR verbs and add them on to those key power verbs that we saw. So I'm just going to give you a quick moment to glance here, see if anything captures your eye. But these are some great options. All you have to do is just even Google AR verbs, and then you can jot some of those good ones down so that you can make them work with those key power verbs. Okay. So a couple of uh, suggestions here. You can always say, no debe fumar. See, you should not smoke. See, favor de levantar el brazo. Do me the favor of lifting or raising your arm if you're going to do an exam of some sort. And I'm going to add on a couple of other AR verbs quickly here so that you can take a, another close look, see if there's anything there that catches your eye. But this is the beauty of Spanish. This is a great way of avoiding conjugating, yet still communicating in a very correct way professional manner. I'm going to take us to our ER verb list, which is a much shorter list. And I do want to point out the ER verbs and the IR verbs will have the same endings in the yo, which is the I form, and the usted, the U formal form. So what does that mean? You don't have to memorize a separate set of endings if you're actually going to be conjugating. But a good one here, we saw comer, right? So necesita comer más frutas y vegetales. Necesita beber is another word to drink, like tomar, más agua. So again, you have some options here to work with. Now, I'm going to finally take us to the last list of IR verbs. If you see anything that catches your eye, jot it down. Uh, but again, these are some great options to just communicate with those key power verbs. Now, I want to point out this verb resistir, favor de resistir mi mano. Do me the favor of resisting. It's almost like saying against my hand. It bypasses the whole, you know, push against my hand with your head. Push, pull, that entire neuro exam. You can get a lot of it with just simply resista or favor de resistirme or favor de resistir mi mano. Okay. Bien. Now, I just want to take these last few minutes to get across how we can properly close, which is pretty much going to be how you introduce yourself uh, to your patients. So you want to end your visit with your Latino patient in a culturally sensitive manner. What does that mean? The smile, the warm tone of voice, the waving. Again, if you can thank your Latino patient for trusting you with their health care. These are parts of our life that are so private for many. So for us to actually go out and really share all of this information can be very difficult, again, for many Latinos. So a nice way to say that in Spanish is gracias por su confianza. Don't forget to add in our name, Senora Gomez. And again, send those greetings and regards to the entire family. It really, really makes a difference. And it's another way of demonstrating personalismo. Remember that personal touch being the polite, the kind, the warm, the social interaction, again, just for a moment, but it still signals that you are trying to achieve that confianza. Any Spanish you can attempt to use, those courtesy phrases will really go a long way. Even if it's just the introduction and the end, it's good. It just shows that you care. So a couple of terms to add on to the goodbyes. Cuídese, which we saw a few slides ago, the take care. You might want to add on, cuídese mucho, señora Gomez. Don't forget to add on the last name. Another nice way to say, goodbye, que le vaya bien, which means may it go well for you, combined with take care, have a nice day, all in one. I know many of you might be familiar with adios, which is goodbye, not a problem. Eh, buen día, or que tenga buen día, or espero que tenga buen día, or espero que le vaya bien. All of those are fine. The nice thing with the cuídese and the que le vaya bien, however, are you're wishing your patient well. So it's not just bye, it's I really hope all goes well for you. And that is really meaningful in the Latino culture. Gracias por su confianza. We talked about that one and the saludos a la familia. I really want to encourage for those of you that are get, just getting started, try to add these on and you'll start to notice a difference. Ahora, para ustedes que ya hablan muy bien el español, yo sé que algo de esto a lo mejor fue útil. La mayoría ya lo sabían. 
pero yo les recomiendo intentar utilizar un español más formal, utilizando la forma de usted en vez de la forma de tú y usando, por ejemplo, permítame en vez de puedo, porque esas son traducciones literales que no se acostumbra mucho. Así es de que espero que hayan aprendido algo nuevo. I hope that you have learned something new. I want to thank you so much for your time and I would love to answer any questions questions that you might have. If you're curious, we do have other services. We offer our virtual trainings, not just for medical Spanish, but for cultural competency. We have our one-on-ones as well, self-study programs, and our complete medical Spanish textbook authored by uh, the Rios team and published by McGraw-Hill. So everything that we covered is in the book. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, at this point, Dr. Einstein, I will turn it back over to you to see if there are any questions that I can answer for the group. Wonderful, Dr. Rios, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. You get me so excited. <laughs> um, I love your presentation style and, and I know you covered a lot of information and it was just um, it was just terrific. So thank you so much. We do have some questions and I'll do my best to go through them. Um, so first is, can you give us a quick lesson on how to address surnames in ID? And I'm not sure what the I capital D stands for, but. Okay, so I don't know the idea, but I can't answer this. And that's a great, great question. And I'm happy, by the way, uh, to send over a slide on the naming conventions, Dr. Eisen, maybe we could share that as well. Uh, but it is a whole lesson, so don't feel bad, but here's the deal. So the surnames, the way it works is, the first of the two last names, is usually the one you want to use. So remember the macho culture, many people identify the Latino culture with the macho culture. What does that mean is again, a lot of it refers to the macho carrying more weight. So what does that mean? The father's surname is the one that is going to continue down the line and the one that you would use. So for example, Señor Juan Carlos Gomez Perez, usually you will refer to him as Señor Gomez. So again, it's gonna be the first of the two last names. However, for the women, if the women are married, it's often to take on our husband's father's last name. So we will continue with our father's last name, take on our husband's father's last name. So for example, Maria Ana Lara de Gomez, and she will be referred to as Senora Gomez. There's more to it, but that at least you'll get the gist of it. And you can always ask if you have any questions. ¿Qué prefiere? Señor Gómez or Señor Pérez? But usually it's the first of the two last names for the, the man. And then if the woman is married, it'll be the last last name. Great. Thank you. The next is for mental health instead of medical health. Would you use mental over medico? Yes, yeah, so the way we refer to mental health is, it's a long one, la salud mental y bienestar. ¿Sí? So la salud mental y bienestar. Bienestar meaning well-being, so it kind of softens it up. Okay, um, the next question is, um, for those whom are basic speakers, may we have words for better understanding? Not okay. Yes, yeah, so with any specific, you know, my suggestion, some really great words for better understanding would be going back to that list of cognates. And we, uh, you can also Google cognates in Spanish, and that's probably the easiest way to quickly pick up more vocabulary and add it to your already existing uh, vocabulary. Beware, there are false cognates though. And I just wanna share, it means it's a word that sounds like it means the same thing, but it means something entirely different. For example, introducir, technically it is to introduce in Spanish, but many people will use it to, like introduce a person to a person, but we use it to actually introducir el suppositorio, the suppository, el especulo, the speculum. So again, beware of false cognates, but I want to encourage cognates. You guys can Google that. You can find a whole list of them. That's probably going to be your easiest way to begin with your terms. Thank you. How do I choose between formal usted and informal tú? I notice necesita is the formal form. I understand different countries have different expectations. 
That is correct, absolutely. So the majority of Latin America does tend to gravitate towards using the usted form, but you are absolutely right. There are some uh, countries that use the tu and there's also the boss and the boss. So there's a lot of other uh, areas which do cause the confusion of which one do I use? Now, if the majority of your patients are from Mexico, definitely the usted form. So I want to share with this, always start off with usted, because we as Latinos will be sure to correct you and let you know, oh, you can use the tu form. In fact, we have a verb in Spanish that is tutear, meaning you can tu me. So that's how in Latin America, we transition from using the usted form to the more casual, personal tu form and familiar form. So what that would sound like would be if I were your patient, so, oh, doctora, me puede tutear, you can tu me, or tuteme, tu me. But again, when in doubt, I think it's better to start off with the usted form. And if we have a preference, we'll be sure to let you know. And then I say, oh, me puede tutear, you can tu me. If you don't hear that, just assume you're going to continue with those dead for it. Thank you. How would you say the following? We need to check your blood with some tests. We checked your lab results. I need to check on something. Okay. So in Spanish, a great way to say the, we need to check your blood. We have a great way to say blood work. I know a lot of people say labs and, and blood work and oftentimes we'll literally translate that. So in Spanish, we refer to that as análisis de sangre o estudios de sangre. So here you can use a great necesita, key power verb, necesita hacer su análisis de sangre. You need to do or make Remember, it has those two meanings, your blood work. Necesita hacer sus estudios de sangre. See, you need to do, or if you're actually going to be the one doing it, then you can just say, voy a, or permítame hacerle sus estudios de sangre or análisis de sangre. For those of you that actually be drawing blood, you can also say, voy a sacar una muestra de sangre, muestras a sample. Okay. And I need to go back to Dr. Einstein. There were two other questions. Could, could you repeat? Okay, those so, um, so we need to check your blood with some tests. We checked your lab results. Okay. Um, so and, I, and I need to check on something. Okay, so we checked your lab results. The verb revisar is a good verb to check. You can also use checar and chequear, which are both uh, they're both approved by the Royal Academy of Spain, and many of you might chuckle with that, but we do 500 plus million Spanish speakers in the world. We refer to the Royal Academy of Spain. Those are correct terms. Revisar, checar, or chequear. So you can say, checamos los resultados. See, the resultados, the results. See, or remember, permítame. Permítame checar los resultados, or permítame revisar. Or if you need to check something with a colleague, permítame verificar con mi colega, or whoever it might be, la doctora, el técnico, etc. So see, we can already use some of the terms that we saw. Great, thank you. How would you ask about sexual history in a way that is culturally appropriate, gender identity and sexual orientation, sexual practices? Excelente pregunta. That is an excellent question. And especially in the Latino culture where it still is very taboo to even address those questions, to even ask them. So I think an excellent, very sensitive way to preface that whole scenario is just to start off with the, remember the permítame. Permítame hacerle unas preguntas personales. Para ustedes que ya hablan muy bien el español, eh, le pueden agregar, permítame hacerle unas preguntas íntimas. Estas preguntas se las hacemos a todos nuestros pacientes. No se preocupe, eh, en confianza, eh, todo se queda en confianza. Tranquilo, tranquila. So again, we're using a lot of what we saw in those key power verbs. If you're just getting started with the language, I would just stick with, permítame hacer unas preguntas personales. Thank you. Can you go over what you taught about saying I'm sorry before giving abnormal lab results? What was the reasoning and how do you say it? Example, lo siento, your diabetes is not controlled. 
Yes. So thank you for asking. It's a great question. So it's always nice in, in the Latino culture, we tend to want to join in and lament with that other person. That's another example of personalismo. You want to join in and almost commiserate. Oh, Señora Gomez, lo siento, whatever the results might be. In this case, lo siento, Señora Gomez, su diabetes no está controlado or controlada, whatever it is we're going to talk about. Then you can give a more upbeat, pero no se preocupe. Remember we saw that, no se preocupe, don't worry. Vamos a darle unas recomendaciones. We're going to give you some recommendations. And then you can use the necesita. ¿sí? Necesita. We just learned checar, chequear, revisar, to check. Necesita checar su nivel de azúcar cada día. Necesita inyectarse la insulina cada día. Necesita comer más, more, go down your list. Necesita comer menos, less, go down that list. So again, those are some great ways to kind of piece together that dialogue. Thank you. Um, how do you say I will refer you to a specialist? Oh, I love that question. It's a great one because a lot of us assume, oh, refer is referir, which technically, I mean, it, it, it is, but it's more Spanglish. It's something we use more here in the U.S. I want to encourage you guys to use recomendar. I know many of you might think, but wait a minute, that, that's to recommend, which it is, but it's also the way we say I'm going to refer you to. So remember the future tense voy a? Perfect, we just add on recomendar. Voy a recomendarle con un especialista, literally with a specialist. Or you can fill in the blank with who that specialist is. If you recall those cognates, voy a recomendarle con un neurologo. Remember, ologo endings, ologist in English. Voy a recomendarle con un cardiologo, etc. Thank you. I know we're at the top of the hour. Anna, I know you had a question about kids and uh, maybe I can have Dr. Rios respond to you via email. Thank you for that great question. I wanted to thank uh, Moses Lake Community Health Center for requesting this educational session today. I wanted to thank all of our additional Maven Project clinic partners and to a huge thank you to all of the healthcare providers who are taking care of your patients that are in underserved areas and being in the front lines and wanting to learn more about how cultural sensitivity and improve ways of communicating with your Spanish-speaking patients. I think it's terrific. Um, uh, as Dr. Rio said, through the MAVEN project, she is available for um, additional one-hour talks on a variety of um, uh, Spanish, medical Spanish, and relating to your patients. Um, in addition, her company, Rios Associates, is available as an individual if you ever wanted to um, register for any of her classes and courses, um, as well as um, if your clinic lead wants to offer a more in-depth period of time for your clinic that she can work with you um, for a nonprofit rate. So um, I will put that information in the slide deck that I'll be sending you later today. Um, the recording of this session will be available on our Maven Project website within about two weeks. And um, it was just really great to have Dr. Rios today. Many, many thanks. Muchas gracias. Um, this was terrific. Thank you. Muchas gracias a todos. Saludos.